By the way, my American name is TJ. That's much easier than Turtico. Uh, yeah. And I'm JB. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll talk about the non-aligned and uh, what uh, Arne said yesterday that Yugoslavia was or stressed out the importance of Yugoslavia. I couldn't agree more with, with uh, that. Though I have to say that there are two important countries uh, in, in the non-aligned, only two. One was Yugoslavia and the other one was India. So without these two countries, nothing was possible, you know. India uh, was almost 50% of the movement. You know, it was that big. Yugoslavia was the political motor of, of everything. And these two countries remained active in the non-aligned, Yugoslavia until uh, uh, the breakup of Yugoslavia. Uh, India is still a member, but uh, is such a big country, you know, has other uh, political agendas, I guess. Uh, the movement of the non-aligned was already in crisis after the second summit, uh, uh, which was held in, in uh, Egypt, in Cairo. Uh, and Yugoslavs were trying everything to do something about that. In 1966, in May of 1966, Tito went to Alexandria, uh, last time on his famous historical uh, ship Galeb, uh, to meet Nasser, I don't know, they, they met 22 times uh, uh, since Nasser became head of uh, Egypt, and they decided to have uh, a celebration of the 10th anniversary uh, of uh, the first meeting of the big three of the non-aligned in India. Uh, the big three of the non-aligned were Tito, Nasser and uh, Indian Prime Minister Nehru. Uh, and that meeting was held in uh, New Delhi with uh, Indira Gandhi instead of uh, Nehru, obviously. Uh, and that meeting was actually about, just about sending the message to the third world countries. You know, we are still there, you know, they were not uh, talking about anything in particular, you know, uh, just sending the message that we are still here, you know, uh, still dealing with those issues, whatever. Yugoslavs were at the same time afraid of the initiative, uh, of this Cuban-sponsored initiative. Uh, at the beginning of 1966, there was a, a meeting of the organization of the solidarity with peoples of Africa, Asia, and uh, Latin America, and that was directly contradicting the Yugoslav idea of the non-alignment, uh, which, and I mean, there was no place for, for a European country in, in such, a, such a vision of the Third World as Cubans uh, uh, have. So, uh, after the meeting in, in New Delhi, uh, there were a series of other meetings of the business people uh, from, from the Third World countries, namely these two, especially these two countries, uh, with a very poor results, though. And the war of 1967 changed so many things. Uh, Yugoslavia, like never before or never after 1948, leaned to the east. Tito uh, not only broke up diplomatic relations with Israel, but went to Moscow on a meeting uh, uh, of the Warsaw Pact countries. Yugoslavia was not part of the Warsaw Pact in order to, to see how Yugoslavia might assist uh, 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 the Arabs. Uh, in 1967. Uh, total crisis of the movement, you know, that lasted for, for, for a year, uh, but in 1968, Yugoslavs uh, were again busy trying to revive uh, uh, the movement prior to the Soviet intervention in Czechoslovakia. So uh, I'll just read you or try to quote uh, a little thing from uh, uh, that was said at the meeting of. Uh, the joint session of the Presidency and uh, Executive Committee uh, of the Central Committee of the Yugoslav League of Communists uh, in 1968, when Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, Nikesic, uh, a famous Serbian politician, uh, actually uh, supported uh, so or praised Soviet presence in in the Mediterranean. You know, the Soviet fleet came in, into the Mediterranean, and he both and Tito said, well. In a way, it's very useful to have the Soviet fleet. I wish them to be even stronger than they are uh, now, vis-a-vis -vis the Americans. That, those are Tito's words, Nikolic said approximately the same. But one day, the Americans will leave, and then they, the Soviets, should leave uh, too. Uh, 
a little bit before that, in early of 19, in early 19, in January of 1968, uh, there was a preparatory meeting in Rome of the Medit for the Mediterranean Conference of the so-called progressive uh, parties. Uh, Seventeen parties were supposed to participate. Italian communists were organizing that uh, meeting. Yugoslavia was represented by a front-like organization, uh, uh, which was called. Uh, 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 the Socialist, Socialist Alliance of the Working People. Um, and Yugoslav platform, the document Yugoslav presented, uh, became the basis for the April uh, summit. Though something changed in the meantime, uh, there was a meeting of the communist parties uh, in Budapest uh, uh, one month later, and the Soviets managed to persuade uh, the French Communist Party, the Italian Communist Party, the Cypriots to change up their minds. Uh, so the meeting held, the Mediterranean Conference held in April of 1968 in Rome, uh, finished with a declaration which was not signed by the Yugoslavs. Uh, because the Yugoslavs were opposing, uh, uh, what was missing from the, from the original draft was uh, a sentence that there must be a simultaneous elimination of all foreign military presence in, in uh, uh, Mediterranean. And the Yugoslavs uh, were opposing that, you know, just Americans are bad guys and that, that only the Americans should leave uh, uh, the Mediterranean. Interestingly enough, uh, wrote that Yugoslavs, uh, or Tito, uh, uh, repeated that almost uh, uh, exactly like, like that to President Nixon during his uh, visit to Yugoslavia in 1970. Uh, saying that, uh, you know, when we say that to, to the Russians, they get mad, and you are insulted when we say that uh, to you. Nixon, to, to Tito's words, said, well, we, we, we do not take that as an insult. We only think that you cannot look at the Soviets in our presence uh, with the same glasses in, uh, in the Mediterranean. Uh, however, uh, Soviet intervention in uh, Czechoslovakia in 1968 changed, changed all dynamics uh, because Yugoslavs were uh, really scared of uh, everything that uh, happened. And the importance of the non-aligned for Yugoslavia became even bigger. You know, uh, uh, we, we heard yesterday how many uh, small countries of the Mediterranean are very ambitious. Uh, Yugoslavia was an extremely ambitious country. Tito was an extremely ambitious leader. Uh, after, after the Second World War with his plans to have a Balkan Federation, you know, after, uh, after that, uh, with a special path to socialism, you know, he was uh, also playing that card. But then the non-alignment non remained the only international podium for Yugoslav ideas, uh, uh, really. And it became one of the fundaments uh, of the Yugoslav uh, uh, regime. So uh, uh, the idea, some of the non-aligned countries, and some even of the very important non-aligned countries like uh, Ethiopia, for instance, wanted to have a conference uh, dedicated to the Soviet intervention in uh, Czechoslovakia that was not to be because so many countries opposed, uh, namely Egyptian president said again, you know, I'm not going to participate in such a conference because everything I get, it's coming from the Soviet Union. But nevertheless, uh, 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 the attempt to uh, organize uh, another summit, which started, by the way, prior to the Soviet intervention in Czechoslovakia. So it's not that the Yugoslavs, you know, discovered what Soviets really mean, you know, and that they've started with preparations. Uh, by Tito's uh, sending uh, letters to uh, all participants of the second uh, summit in, in Cairo, uh, eventually uh, uh, happened. You know, in spite of, uh, as it was said uh, later, Arab obstruction, uh, which was defeated, leftist radicalism, which was subdued with realistic, progressive solutions, and some important countries on the right, especially Asian, were moved to the positive positions uh, once the, the summit took place in Lusaka in, in, in Africa. Uh, while Yugoslavs were trying to organize that summit, uh, there was one Mediterranean country that was uh, opposing the original idea to invite everyone who was participating at the second summit, and that was Algeria. Algerians were uh, 
supported by Congo, Brazzaville, Syria, Cuba, Somalia, uh, thought that all, only the most progressive countries should participate, and not everyone. Uh, but as I said, you know, Arab obstruction was defeated, uh, and there was a summit in, in, in Lusak. Uh, from that moment onwards, I would say, for Yugoslavia, non-alignment became everything in, in, the, in the foreign policy. So important that they uh, thought how President Nixon's visit to Belgrade, Zagreb, and Tito's birthplace, uh, Kumrovic, was because of the success uh, in, uh, uh, in, in Africa. That's not true. I've seen uh, uh, documents from, from the College Park uh, in which you can find that Nixon, uh, in his memo to, to in, uh, Kissinger, in his memo to President Nixon, wrote, you know, do mention or you can mention the non-aligned, otherwise not important, but dear to his heart. Uh, well, but that's 1970, you know. Uh, and you have another conference in Algeria in 1973, and another one in Sri Lanka in 1976. Uh, uh, but things were changing because uh, uh, it seems, I've found that probably many other documents, but uh, the only thing I've seen are conversations between Henry Kissinger and the Chinese uh, in 74 and 75, uh, where Chinese, Deng Xiaoping for instance, uh, was questioning uh, Americans about uh, uh, the whole Balkan Peninsula, Middle East region, uh, uh, wasn't that part of an old strategy of the Tsar, you know, and then Kissinger replying uh, both in 74 and especially in 75 how we are concerned about Yugoslavia, that's why Americans were selling military equipment to Yugoslavia, and that's why uh, he personally went to Yugoslavia, plus President Ford in 1975, uh, uh, after uh, the conference in, in uh, uh, Helsinki. It will not be like Czechoslovakia, Kissinger stressed uh, once again. Uh, uh, but Americans during this period, you know, were interested, probably more interested in the security of Yugoslavia, but less interested in the non-aligned. They became, uh, nevertheless, more uh, interested when Cuba, or after Cubans, became so visible and so eager to take over the movement. You know, after the successes in Africa, uh, uh, especially uh, uh, when Cubans became candidates to organize a summit in 1979, uh, and Americans were uh, paying much attention to, uh, to the preparations of, of the summit. And so were Yugoslavs too. Tito, uh, uh, Tito went to seven Mediterranean countries, or seven uh, uh, countries, let's say Mediterranean countries, uh, Kuwait and Iraq among uh, those, uh, uh, Libya, Algeria, uh, 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 Jordan, Syria, uh, and Malta, to talk with their leaders to prepare them for, uh, for the summit in, uh, in Cuba. Uh, I'll just quote what uh, Yugoslavs got from, uh, through diplomatic channels, what Andrei Gromikos said about uh, Tito's uh, tour around Mediterranean in 79, in early 79, uh, to the Polish uh, uh, party secretary Gierek and his minister of foreign affairs. Uh, Tito's tour among the Arabs was, and I quote, objectively on the line of torpedoing the Soviet influence and strengthening of the non-aligned movement but under the Yugoslav flag. Uh, and that's actually what, what, what happened in, in Havana uh, in 79. And it wasn't easy for the Yugoslavs because Egyptians <coughs> were uh, not helping uh, at all. <coughs> Egypt was not part of the Arab League at the time and there was an attempt to uh, kick them out of the movement, you know. So, uh, uh, not only that Minister of Foreign Affairs didn't go, Boutros Boutros Ghali was representing uh, uh, Egypt in, in Havana, uh, fearing, uh, trying to, uh, fearing that what, what might happen, but Yugoslavs were opposing that, as well as most of the African countries, unlike uh, the rest of the Arab uh, world. But what they managed, they managed to preserve the movement on the so-called uh, genuine or 
uh, align or ketones uh, uh, align. Uh, if I have to stop here, then I can't start touch on, on uh, Afghanistan and what happened. Yeah, Afghanistan is irrelevant. Afghanistan is very important. You know, so they, they managed to save the movement. But in 1979, after the Soviet intervention, you know, you didn't have, a, or, or Yugoslavia didn't have even uh, 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 India behind uh, uh, them because they wanted to condemn the Soviet intervention in uh, a non-aligned socialist country like Afghanistan, non-aligned socialist and not part of the Warsaw Pact just as Yugoslavia, non-aligned socialists, not part of the Warsaw Pact, there was intervention. They wanted uh, non-aligned for the first time ever to condemn the Soviets through the mechanisms of the non-aligned. Uh, acting alone, de facto, you know, Egypt was not there, India was not there, now being scared of the, the growing importance of, of Pakistan, you know. So what they did, they managed in a way, they managed uh, to have a regular session of the non-aligned organized a little bit before than it was scheduled, you know, uh, uh, and there was a mild condemnation of, of the Soviets. But the whole uh, diplomacy around it was uh, fascinating, I would say. Uh, and of course, when you when you take, I, I can talk more about that. When you when you look at that, then uh, of course that American administration finally, you know, started to, to, to look at the non-aligned as, as something that actually might help or that actually might play certain importance uh, in, in the global uh, arena. Thank you okay. so much. JB. Uh, thank you, JB. Um, <laughs> I, um, I'll try to keep it to 15 minutes as advertised. Uh, so, in my uh, paper and talk, uh, I'm focusing on uh, a particular aspect of Algeria's relations with the United States in the early 70s, in particular with regards to the uh, oil and gas sector. Uh, and it's an interesting uh, period in time because since Algerian independence in 1962, the two countries, Algeria and the US, have had generally not agreed on economic matters or on political matters. Algeria is one of the more prominent uh, <coughs> radical third world countries that is generally very critical of the U.S. position in the world and its economic position. Uh, but one of the interesting uh, developments that happened this sort of an, a wild oscillation in the early 70s, in effect, whereby uh, in 1971, in February 1971, the Algerians, uh, the Algerian government nationalized uh, their oil and gas industries, largely at the expense of French companies, which had dominated the sector uh, since independence. And this coincided with the Algerians forming new agreements with uh, American companies in particular, uh, which were on more favorable terms to the Al Algerians in terms that they, that they uh, wanted to be as the model for their uh, oil and gas sectors moving forward. Uh, in um, uh, Well, the agreements were first signed in 68 uh, and 69, but implemented in 1971. So in effect, the Algerians were sort of substituting U uh, US role for French role uh, in the oil and gas sector. Um, at the time, uh, Wari Boumediene, the, the president, uh, said that we are not dogmatic, the world goes much too fast for theories, and this is no longer 1917. This is a time when men are going to other planets, and we have chosen realism our, as our method. So he was saying this, he was addressing, well, both an American and an Algerian audience in this case, essentially to justify what seemed to be a, a sort of reversal of, of the Algerian government's uh, ideological position over the past 10, uh, 10 years. And I think it's a very interesting moment because it's not the oil and gas sector per se that I'm interested in, but I think it comes at the intersection of uh, a lot of broad changes in the international system. On the one hand, there is um, detente in a Cold War sense. I think um, uh, what Boumediene was saying and saying that the world is moving too fast for theories and we're not dogmatic, he's signaling a sort of uh, a sort of detente vis-a-vis -vis the third world and the United States, a sort of um, ideological de-escalation uh, in between North and South as well, or at least so he says. Um, and I think it also coincides with um, important structural changes in the global economy, whereby um, the uh, Western economies, the American economy in particular, is starting to uh, uh, have a great deal of difficulties, and the, the 1970s is a period that uh, the global economy changes substantially and comes out in the 1980s of rather different structures. 
And what, what's interesting about this period is that this sort of seems to be almost the pinnacle of the, the third worldist moment in an economic sense. Algeria, as we've well established now, being the pivotal third world state. Uh, oil and gas being perhaps the pivotal third worldist, the pivotal third worldist commodities. Uh, and so why does, I'm interested, why, just at the moment that, why does the third worldist economic project um, seem to be at its peak right before it becomes uh, outmoded and seems to have failed uh, greatly, as most people would agree, in the 1980s. Um, so I want to sort of zero in on the history of Algerian-U.S. Uh, relations regarding economics uh, and oil and gas in particular, try and sort of look at these bigger issues uh, through this narrower lens. Um, and the first thing, uh, the key to the Algerian-U.S. relationship, in my view, is the, is the sense that, um, in a sense, Algerian nationalism uh, developed and matured and uh, Algerian independence was gained essentially in, in a period of the uh, American Imperium or American economic and uh, political hegemony. And there's an interesting, as a result of this, essentially the Algerians have an interesting ambivalence towards American power uh, that perhaps is encapsulated in, the, in the, one of the main museums, the Museum of the National Army in Algiers, which essentially the whole museum is a, is a is a, a, a testament to the Algerian national identity and trying to establish a nationalist history uh, for the country. And one of the, the prize pieces there now is a treaty signed in 1815 between the American government and the Ottoman day of Algiers at the time, because the Americans came across and shelled Algiers, and the uh, uh, Ottoman day agreed to essentially stop Barbary raids on American shipping. Uh, so this seems like it's not necessarily something that the Algerians should be because uh, it, it commemorates essentially their military defeat by the American Navy, but it also proves, uh, in their view, that an Algerian, some sort of Algerian polity existed before French colonization. So I think it sort of epitomizes, on the one hand, uh, their, their need for American power, uh, but on the other hand, their, uh, a certain resentment of it as well. Um, and so, uh, throughout uh, the American power made a great impression on the Algerian nationalist movement in World War II because the American army invaded North Africa to defeat the uh, Vichy French forces in Algiers and North Africa. Uh, and from it was that point forward that the Algerian nationalist movement, as a core piece of their strategy throughout the War of Independence from 54 to 62, was appealing to American power. The American invasion in the Second World War had proved to them that there was a far more powerful force out there than France, superior in economic terms and military terms and technological terms and that they were hoping that uh, they would essentially appeal to the United States and the US eventually would be the, the arbiter would force France to uh, release Algeria. Uh, so that's one aspect of them feeling that they, they need the United States. And I think this sense remains after independence. Uh, another important uh, impact on Algerian nationalism of the uh, quote unquote American imperium, as I'm putting it, is the, the emphasis on economics and development. Uh, because the War of Independence is happening at a time when the Cold War is talking very much about economic issues. There's a massive consumer revolution in France itself. It's sort of the backdrop between the French and the Franco-Algerian paradigm to the War of Independence, uh, the Nixon-Kissinger kitchen debates. Uh, and so in the latter stages of the War of Independence, it becomes very much about economic issues, with the French and the FLN promising Algerians that they, they were the ones who would deliver uh, more material prosperity uh, and economic development. Uh, and as a result, uh, after independence, there was two main prongs to the Algerian economic strategy, I think. The first hand is, the first is oil and gas, which was discovered during the War of Independence in the Sahara. And the uh, idea that the Algerians would like oil and gas to be the motor of their industrialization and development, not just in terms of export revenues, um, but they talk, uh, what ideally they would like it to be, not just a source of cash, but to uh, use the oil and gas sector as essentially the, the skeleton upon which further industrialization and development would be built. As this being the, the infrastructure that you would, around sort of distribution uh, and gas liquefaction uh, plants and so on, this would, this would give rise to a sort of organic uh, uh, industrialization program, apart from just getting uh, uh, large amounts of money for actually exporting these. Uh, goods. Uh, and then the second prong of Algerian economic strategy was diversification, trying to reduce France's dominant role in just about every aspect of their economy, uh, oil and gas uh, in particular. Uh, 
And so uh, the United States played into this strategy in the sense that although the Algerians were very suspicious and generally hostile to the American economic role in the world, on the other hand, their immediate, even after independence, their immediate imperial foe in economic terms is France. Whereas the US, while they saw it as, a, as a, perhaps the greatest um, uh, imperial power, was a more distant one. For them, particular, in their particular situation, it was a more distant one. Distant one. It was the lesser of two imperial evils, uh, imperial evils, if you will. And so in, during the 1960s, after independence, the Algerian government tried to uh, attract US uh, interest in the Algerian economy to get uh, US businesses to start to um, uh, supplant French businesses, essentially give them alternative sources of trade uh, beside France, which doesn't really work in the early mid-1960s, partly because the US government doesn't want to be in the position of replacing France, because that will be uh, uh, very upsetting to uh, the French government, uh, and also because of their differences about uh, Cuba and Congo and Vietnam uh, and all these sort of third world issues, so, so their relations uh, deteriorate throughout the 60s. Uh, and the culmination of this deterioration is um, in 1967 when the Algerians actually break diplomatic relations with the US uh, in the wake of the um, Arab-Israeli war in 1967. Um, and that's, that's the point when things get very interesting, because now relations are actually broken and there will be no official diplomatic relations between the two countries uh, throughout the late 60s and early 70s. But it's during this period of time that their economic relations suddenly really start to escalate, uh, taking off from 1970. By the mid-70s, in fact, the US will have replaced France as Algeria's chief uh, trading partner, uh, which is a very dramatic uh, reversal of fortune given uh, the, the history that I've just summated here. Uh, and there's, there's uh, I think there's um, a few reasons for this. Uh, okay. The first being that I think there's a reversal, there's complementary changes in uh, American and Algerian thinking, perhaps. On the American side, I think there's essentially a less ideological uh, economic engagement with the third world, uh, whereby, for example, Kennedy and Johnson have both emphasized sort of trying to get third world, competing ideologically for the correct development models with the Soviet Union and the Chinese in the third world. And I think this is a much smaller agenda for the Nixon administration. Uh, also, the Nixon administration, I think, had a sense, a newfound sense of American economic weakness. Uh, Nixon spoke in terms of the United States almost sort of becoming a new Rome or Greece or a fading empire. Um, there was, in 1970, was the pinnacle of American oil production, and from that point onwards, the United States becomes a, a net importer of oil and gas, and this is a point at which uh, energy security and all these sort of things that people talk about a lot today, again, start to be uh, discussed a lot in the United States. And there's a sort of a sense, perhaps, of uh, almost managing an imperial decline uh, in the Nixon administration vis-a-vis -vis detente with the Soviet Union and perhaps uh, agreements like the new oil and gas agreements with Algeria. On the Algerian side of things, uh, their situation reaches uh, a crux because uh, their other main export is uh, wine, and essentially the uh, French government stopped buying wine in the quantities and prices that the Algerians felt they had agreed to. And there's very interesting documents uh, on the Algerian side of things where the senior figures are discussing this. And essentially it's the wine crisis that, that forces their hand, and they talk explicitly about, you know, we can't wait anymore, it's time to pay the oil card. It's because the, Fr the French won't play ball on wine, so now we're going to hurt them on oil and gas. Uh, and that's when they, it's exactly at this period of time that they turn to, and if you look at the Algeria documents, the things that are going to uh, crossing the media's desk and so forth, this is all extremely explicit, uh, they'll turn to the Americans, not because they love the Americans, but they're the only credible alternative. Uh, well, that's true. They actually, the Soviets agreed to buy their wine, uh, but at much reduced prices, but probably larger quantities. But, um, uh, and so that's sort of, that's, that's the backdrop to, uh, the, the new agreements. And the other interesting aspect about the agreements is that they're formed, the two main ones are with Getty Oil and El Paso Gas, a company in Texas. And they, they give more advantageous uh, uh, terms to the Algerians. Um, the Algerians will own 51% of these new joint enterprises. And also, El Paso Gas agrees to build gas liquefaction plants and so forth in Algeria. And this really suits the Algerian strategy, which they're actually cooperating with the Libyans on. 
first of all, they're going to smaller companies like Getty because they're trying to break the stranglehold of Shell and the other uh, major companies. Uh, okay. Uh, and then uh, El Paso Gas is agreeing to build these, um, uh, these, this infrastructure and these facilities. That is finally uh, promises to fulfill the long-standing Algerian mission of turning oil and gas from something not just being a cash cow, but into a motor of industrialization and development uh, in itself. Um, and so that's, that's the, uh, essentially the cause for these agreements uh, in, in 1971, and the Americans quite consciously agreeing to start to supplant the French role in Algeria, which they had resisted doing for a decade. Um, and then the final twist in this tale, of course, comes in 1973 uh, with the uh, OPEC embargo and another Arab-Israeli war, um, the uh, non-aligned uh, and various third worldist meetings in Algiers, uh, in that summer, and so that's an interesting uh, another sort of oscillation in the other direction again, where once again the Algerian-American relationship starts seems to become more antagonistic again. In '73 and '74, in particular, Algeria seems to be at the forefront of an uh, increasingly confident third world, so largely on the basis of the massive boost in oil and gas revenues and OPEC's successful embargo, um, and so. Uh, to a certain degree, I was struck by the way that the um, American officials at the time were talking very much in the similar terms to the way that French officials had spoken about losing Algeria, uh, in the sense that um, Pompidou, for example, had called the oil price rises in 1971 a Hitlerian diktat. Um, Kissinger talks about then OPEC in 73 as being a declaration of war. Uh, Henry Kissinger, who was a great admirer of Charles de Gaulle, it starts imitating de Gaulle's language and talking in terms of interdependence, which is exactly the sort of language that de Gaulle used uh, after Algerian independence to justify uh, sort of continued uh, economic engagement in Algeria. Uh, so to a certain degree, I think it's interesting because it's almost in their own language, the Americans and the Algerians almost seem to agree on the, on the notion that America is an imperial power uh, and is an empire itself. Um, and of course, then the, my final point I want to make on this is, is the ironic aspect of all this, of course, is that within a few years, this, uh, this moment will seem to be almost a distant past, and this sort of sense of third world is ascent uh, comes to seem very obsolete. Uh, and essentially, I, I, I connect that to the sort of new globalization era in the late 70s and 80s. And I think one of the ironies is that the strategies that the Algerian had towards oil and gas inadvertently encourage that, because their emphasis on diversifying the companies they were dealing with, uh, diver uh, going to smaller companies, and actually making, they thought that this was weakening the power of the major uh, 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 Anglo-American oil companies and giving them a stronger negotiating position. Uh, but in the end, of course, what happens is that the oil and gas sector becomes so diversified and so complicated that it's impossible for even producing companies like the OPEC, OPEC companies to repeat what they did uh, in 1973, uh, and so I think there's an interesting sort of, essentially the the uh, um, the third world is strategy, economic strategy was was uh, buyed into a sort of imperial economic strategy that uh, allocated certain commodities as uh, strategic importance and thought that you had to control access to these commodities and monopolize access to these commodities, and the third world strategy was accepted those principles to try to reverse the balance of power, and I think that entire um, sort of strategic way of looking at commodities essentially becomes obsolete in the in the 1980s and 1990s, um, giving us the situation today where people can neither uh, dominate production or consumption of, of uh, those commodities despite their supposed strategic importance. Thank you so much. I'm going to invite now some brief, uh, still trenchant comments from, and I'm not editorializing here, BS, and then uh, our <laughs> Not too long, sorry. No, but BS. Yes. <laughs> uh, so, this is a, this is a, uh, this is actually a really great paper of time. I don't have much in the way of, of criticism, which fits with, with Bob tyrannical. Uh, management of the clock. Um, but I think it comes out of, of a project that I think is going to have a, a really uh, big impact on the way that we think about, about revolutionary nationalism in the third world during the Cold War. 
uh, where much of the literature so far has, has really been on the sort of bilateral relations between the great powers and revolutionary movements, and I think that Jeff's dissertation and some of the work that he's writing about here is going to really transform the way we think about, about nodal states such as Algeria in reshaping international relations in the 1960s and 70s. Um, there's, a really, there's a really sort of rich line in here where um, he's quoting Boumediene, who is saying that, that, quote, there are no opposing interests between U.S. oil corporations and Algeria. And there's something highly ironic about the self-described sort of leader of, of of sort of revolutionary liberal nationalism in the late 60s, uh, staking out a very conservative sort of realist pragmatist position on, on the development prospects that Algeria had if it didn't find a way to work with Western capital, and in particular with a certain sector of the global oil industry uh, that was just then beginning to transform the world oil regime. Um, and when reading this paper, I was, and thinking about the parameters of the conference, I was prompted to ask, to what degree is this a Mediterranean story, to what degree is this a Middle Eastern story, to what degree is this a story about oil, it's much more a story about oil, uh, and to what degree is this a story about Algeria's position in third world politics more generally. Um, and I think that, that in many ways the Cold War sort of frame doesn't really map out onto this story at all, uh, except, except on the margins. Uh, my sense from reading Jeff's paper is that this represents more a, a sort of story about Algeria's attempt to escape from the confines of the Mediterranean basin, the overlapping sort of cultural and, 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 and especially financial and, and trading relationships uh, which seem to constrain Algeria's developmental options and from which the, the new government was attempting to extricate itself. Um, but I think that there are lots of other elements of the story which Jeff talks about in his dissertation slash book that's coming out uh, which maybe we can prompt him to say something about. Uh, one of which is Algeria's emergence as a sort of as a sort of Paris of third world revolutionaries in the nineteen in the nineteen uh, late nineteen sixties with members of the PLO, the Weather Underground, sort of every self styled sort of half assed and, and, and full assed sort of revolutionary is making their way to Algiers to sort of take part in this this sort of bacchanalia of, of a revolutionary party that seems to be going on. Um, and I think that, that it's, it's striking that we see the confluence of these incredibly jarring uh, dynamics taking place at one and the same time. On the one hand, Algeria's emergence as the sort of center of third world revolutionary nationalism, along maybe with Havana, but I think in more dynamic ways than, than Havana itself. Algeria's adoption in 1970 of, of Soviet-style economic planning, and its simultaneous uh, synchronous adoption of a pro-Western uh, petroleum development strategy. This is highly ironic, uh, and I think highly suggestive of the ways that, that at this moment in the history of post-colonial states, uh, that, that the market is breaking down all Chinese walls and frustrating all Soviet development plans. Uh, and I think there's something extraordinarily interesting about a revolutionary Algerian state uh, using, using the revenues uh, supplied by oil and gas production, which is being carried out by independent American companies to finance Soviet-style development plans. Uh, and I think that this is a story that, that tells us much about the, the, the dilemmas that, that third world revolutionary states found themselves in uh, in this period. Um, Burns gives us a sort of mixed, Jeffrey gives us, JB gives us a sort of mixed answer uh, of, to these questions that the U.S. needs and desires Algerian support for its negotiations in the Middle East. It opposes Algeria's revolutionary diplomacy. It desires to wean Algeria from its dependence on France. Uh, and, and it also hopes to, to help facilitate the entry of American companies uh, at one and the same time. And the period of genuine independence that Jeffrey is describing uh, in the midst of all this is extraordinarily short. And that's a sort of five to seven year period where Algeria uh, is making gestures towards a genuine sort of subversive diplomacy uh, that is nationalizing oil companies, criticizing the US uh, on Vietnam in the Six Day War and doing other things. And yet within a year of confiscating American oil companies are already re-entering into negotiations with smaller independent oil companies to basically beg them to come back to Algeria so that they can begin to finance uh, the regime's ambitious development plans. Um, and, I, and I think that it's worth thinking about, about 
what this tells us about the transformation of the world oil regime, which I think that Jeff does a very good job of doing. Getty and El Paso are not integrated oil firms. They're, they're small and mid-sized independent companies that only occupy a single sector of the, of, of the chain of production. And the reason that Algeria and, and, and Libya and other companies are inviting companies like Getty, El Paso, and Occidental into town uh, is that they're willing to offer them much better concession arrangements. Uh, and, and Jeff treats this as, as, as sort of opportunistic uh, in some ways and says that Libya, for example, uh, wants to make an example of Occidental to display the new order of things. But I think that that's, that that's not quite right. Uh, Occidental is seeking markets around the edges of the Middle East along with Getty and El Paso. They're seeking markets in Indonesia and in, in, in Brunei and elsewhere precisely to break this stranglehold of, of the Seven Sisters on the world oil regime. And it's on the margins of this system, primarily in places like Algeria and Libya, Indonesia, Brunei, and a few other places, uh, where this transformation takes place. And I think that that, that solidifies Algeria's in the, or importance in, in the history of the third world as much as its role in, as, a, as, a, as a sort of fulcrum of revolutionary politics. The role that Algeria and Libya play in essentially breaking open the world oil regime is just as fundamental, just as transformative uh, for third world politics as anything it does uh, to provide a safe haven for, you know, for, for black national radical, for black nationalists from the US and elsewhere that want to find a safe place to hang out and smoke hashish. Um, I think that, that by the end of... That wasn't funny. That wasn't in the paper. Um, I think that by the end of this paper, uh, we're left, we're left with, with a, a sense of, of both Algeria and, and the Nixon administration's sort of ambivalence with this state of affairs and a desire to, at least in public terms, uh, let everyone think that they're getting what they want. Algeria gets to continue playing this role uh, within the non-aligned movements along with Libya, which is funding lots of uh, radical movements around the Middle East, while both countries are at the same time relying uh, on Western oil companies to finance their radical politics. Um, and I think that, that, of course, in a few years, this party is going to come crashing down on everyone's heads. Uh, but I think that Jeff's paper gives us a very suggestive, sort of evocative picture of this incredibly sort of contradictory uh, moment in Algeria's post-independence history, and I think gives us a deep sense of the of the vulnerabilities and and dependencies that Algeria found itself in almost immediately after independence, uh, realizing that its fortunes were intimately tied uh, with the world market, with the fate of the world oil regime, and that despite its revolutionary rhetoric, uh, that 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 uh, the market was really the only way that Algeria was going to finance these ambitious development plans. Um, the only thing I would ask him to, to maybe say something about uh, is to describe in a little bit more detail um, how Algeria sort of envisioned uh, the emergence of a petrochemical industry. If they're thinking about using these Soviet development plans as a basis for broad-based industrialization, uh, what did this look like? Uh, were they thinking about fertilizer production, about plastics, about, about synthetic rubber? What was the sort of vision that they had for, for, uh, for petrochemical derivatives and what would this do for Algerian industrialization plans? And secondarily, um, how did the, uh, the Algerian government conceive of uh, its economic ties with Europe, uh, even as it tried to lessen its dependence upon, upon French oil uh, and uh, French oil companies and French finance? Uh, how do they see uh, its trade relations developing with Europe? Did they see them more moving towards Africa and elsewhere? Or did they see it moving more towards closer links with Italy and other countries uh, which seem to share some sympathies with Algeria's uh, radical uh, politics? So I'll leave it at that and turn it over to Thank you. That is so many words. I'm not sure a Finnish person has that many words, but I will try to talk now at least for <laughs> 10 minutes. Good for Finland, I'm sorry. Um, I think it's very interesting. We've been talking almost now for two days about whether there was a Mediterranean history in the Cold War, whether there was a Cold War in the Mediterranean. And today in this paper, and within the last, um, I don't know, day and a half, although we have at the same time formulated three points of view now for not only that there was a Mediterranean and the Cold War and an online movement there, but that who, was, who were the leading countries of it. 
in Tvirtvis paper, they are in India and Yugoslavia. Yesterday, Arne talked about that the pivotal state was Algeria and Yugoslavia. In my view, it is definitely Yugoslavia and Egypt. So that says something, right? We already have a debate about which are the leading states. Well, no debate on Yugoslavia. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, thought, I thought it was at least advantage to study a country that doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> but clearly not. We're studying the Soviet Union. And it's part of the Cold War. <laughs> um, so what I very much liked about Verpo's paper was that it, I think it underlines the theme of this whole workshop. If the name of the workshop was Global Cold War in the Mediterranean, I think that this paper shows how and why we could argue that the, that the Cold War took place in the Mediterranean, but it was also global, right? Because it takes us to conversations that are taking place in Washington, in Cuba, in uh, New Delhi, and many other places, right? So that was the first thing that, that I liked about it, the diversity. We also meet very many, very different types of characters. Um, Marko Nikosic was a Serbian born foreign minister of Yugoslavia who was a liberal, who gets replaced in 1972 because he had liberal ideas of where Yugoslavia should be going. That's a very different kind of character than Kissinger or Nixon or many of these other leaders. Um, I would just say that that is the first thing that comes to mind. There is a lot of diversity, there are reforming liberals, and there are many different events and leaderships in this paper. The other theme that defines this paper for me is a um, fundamental debate about what, it, what non-alignment is. Is non-alignment a political alliance, and in that a political strategy, or is it an ideology? I think that most of us would say that it is a strategy, and that's how we most of the time talk about it. But what brings me closer to this question was the beginning of the presentation here today, the debate about if, the, if India is actually the second large country in the non-aligned movement. For me, India wasn't, because they leave it, and, and, and for me, Yugoslavia and Egypt are the countries that formulate the movement and, and in many ways define it. The other reason why India for me wasn't always the big second country was that if we think about what could be the unifying ideological features of the non-aligned movement, perhaps parallel to or in addition to it being a political alliance and a strategy, yesterday we had a discussion about it and some of these could be maybe the, their debate or, or objection to the north-south divide in international relations. Um, also, I think they were all unified in, in uh, being against apartheid, but also their objection to nuclear weapons. And India might be the country that seeks nuclear weapons very early. So I think that this paper here underlines those debates about what the non-aligned movement is and how we should think about it. And it says something about the Mediterranean, but also about international history. If there is such a thing as a study of international history, or global history, these are themes that are, an, are some kind of an actual topic that one can research to get closer to that. Um, the other thing is that we talk here, I, I think in the direct quotes, for example, from Washington, from, from other places, there are often tones about whether non-alignment or neutralism, as it is sometimes called, has a superior political quality. And I think for the Mediterranean, because we have so many uh, layered or par parallel political and historical discussions, I think it, it is not, it is useful to think about whether we put qualities to this. Are, are there superior and inferior political qualities? Do we talk about them? Does it come out more in some kind of a um, conversation about the North-South divide or about the third world? I often feel like, um, these are some, some, some features that are about the non-aligned movement and that are somehow parallel to questions of national determination or what is nationalism and other definitions. Um, Arne talked about today about periodization of, of the Cold War in the Mediterranean or maybe is that a useful uh, point of entry? I think that here, yes, non-alignment and detente, for example, overlap, 
on due date. That, that is a topic of this paper. Uh, Twerko talked about the um, Helsinki conference, which was a conference of, of the, the, it's a precursor to OSCE. It's a conference on security and cooperation in Europe. I would say that from that perspective, this paper shows that Arne is right, that there is a periodization also in the non-aligned movement, and that could be useful. But on the other hand, then these are some things that, that um, keep repeating themselves, right? In, from 1958 to 1961, there's a discussion if India should be part of this movement. Is it Egypt and Yugoslavia that is formulating the non-aligned movement, or is India in? And then here we have some quotes that I haven't ever seen before with Indira Gandhi. India is making a comeback into this discussion later on. And to me, that shows that yes, there could be periodization, but some things repeat themselves. Um, other than that, I don't have many comments about it. Those are my observations about the paper. Um, what I like about it is that it, 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 it really talks about international history of the Mediterranean, or international history of this movement. Um, I like it that, that there are several different US administrations that make a commentary on the movement here, and not just one, that, that it, it shows a longer period. And that it addresses these fundamental questions about what is a political strategy, what is an ideology, and are there periods here, or is it a longer period? And if there is a movement, who is leading it? in addition to Yugoslavia. <laughs> Great. Great. Um, do you guys want to do the selfish thing and respond to your commentators, or would you like to do the generous thing and open it up? <laughs> <laughs> Not that you put it that way. Superior and inferior. <laughs> uh, so, I'll try to argument why I think India was uh, more important, and why I partially do agree with Rina that well, Egypt was important at the beginning. I'm not giving up Egypt. No, no, okay. <laughs> uh, Indonesia was also <laughs> present. Neither does the US. <laughs> no, listen. Uh, there were many countries that were active at certain periods in, in the non aligned. Cubans were active. Uh, Cubans were present in Belgrade in 61, but they were not active until the, 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 the mid 70s.